Thank you and good evening. We're very excited to be hosting tonight's Brodex event. And thank you all for attending and for the alumni. Welcome back to campus and welcome to our amazing Minskoff Pavilion if you haven't had a chance to see it yet. Um, so as Sean mentioned, I am Judy Whipple and I'm very honored to be the Interim Broad College Dean. And um, I am a pro, uh, proud Broad alum and parent of uh, one current student and two alums, one from Broad. Uh, so I'm very passionate about our student success and student experience, but also about opportunities for lifelong learning and connecting with our alumni. Um, as a Broad faculty member since 2006, I'm also very passionate about how we integrate our core areas of teaching, research, outreach, and service, and how we can build off of those strengths and continue on our path of excellence in those areas. As uh, Sean mentioned, um, Brodex is uh, a series that we've been offering for four years to connect with alumni and the Broad community, uh, but also to feature the thought leadership of faculty in the Broad College. Um, we have a great evening planned for you tonight with three exceptional speakers who are leaders in their field and in their respective areas. Um, before we begin, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the Broad College uh, we, and what we've been focusing on. We have an exceptional vision and mission, a vision to be a top of mind business program with um, reflected on the recognition of our brand, the rankings of our program, and the reputation of our people. And Brodax is one of many events where we really get to highlight the reputation of our people and really get a chance to uh, show the, the different um, uh, excellence that they are um, showing in their research and how they're also bringing that into the classroom. And so I do want to recognize the Broad community as a community of exceptional individuals, teams, students. We have some of our doctoral students as well in the audience tonight and supporters like all of you who really together help us make that vision a reality. We also have a very strong mission where we are focused on creating and disseminating knowledge. That's the first part of our mission. And you're gonna see the evidence of that tonight to collaborate, to develop global transformational leaders. We know that Broad Spartans make a difference in the world around them, and you make a difference in your communities. You're gonna see the difference that our faculty make tonight in their thought leadership, in focusing on, on research that's solving today's complex industry and societal problems. And they make a difference when they bring that research into the classroom to ensure our students are career ready at graduation and beyond. You'll also see this evening is in part uh, how our staff also help make a difference in offering these types of opportunities for us to connect and engage with each other. Also services and experiential learning opportunities that they're providing for our students. And also uh, connecting with our alumni who continue to look to Broad for their continuing education opportunities. So this vision and mission really help us to focus on the moments that matter. Moments that matter to our students, to our stakeholders, and to our community. And those moments are gonna to continue to become an, an, an increasingly more important as we seek ways to remain relevant in a changing world. And that's really in part gonna be driven by our faculty research. Our faculty are focused on researching forward future topics and ideas, and really thinking about what is on that next horizon that we need to be helping industry and society tackle. We've spent a lot of time over the last few years working diligently on our five strategic themes, global mindset, digital transformation, DEI, ethics and integrity, and entrepreneurship and innovation. And you're gonna see those themes weaved through the sessions of our three panelists tonight, our three speakers tonight. And you'll also see how these faculty are really challenging conventional wisdom and really focusing on how we inspire the future of business. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce one of our Brodex presenters and our MC for the evening, Associate Dean of Research, John Hollenbeck. Dr. Hollenbeck holds the position of University Distinguished Professor at Michigan State and the Eli Broad University Professor at the Broad College. Dr. Hollenbeck received his PhD in management from New York University in 1984. He has published over 100 articles and book chapters on important managerial topics, 
including team decision making and work environments. He has served as an editor and associate editor at various prestigious journals over his career. According to Google Scholar, his body of work has been cited over 33,000 times. 33,000 times. What a mind-blowing and amazing accomplishment. Uh, in addition, Dr. Hollenbeck has been awarded over $10 million in external research funding, predominantly from the U.S. Department of Defense and the National Science Foundation. John, thank you for all you do to contribute to research excellence at the Broad College. Thank, thank you. you very much. The stage your, is yours. I'm your MC for tonight. I got a mic on. I brought audio, I brought physical aids. Uh, and I want you to know of those 33,000 citations, 2,000 of those are other people citing me. Uh, 31,000 is me citing myself. <laughs> Uh, but there are like 2,000 in there where uh, we cite some other people. Uh, I'm the Associate Dean for Research here at Michigan State, or at the, at the Eli Broad School here at Michigan State. And I want to talk about our research mission. If you go to the first sentence of the mission statement at Michigan State, it says the following. Uh, Michigan State is a member of the Association of American Universities, AAU, and one of the top 100 research universities in the world. Notice that the first sentence doesn't say anything about teaching. They could have. They didn't. Notice also that the first sentence invokes a reference group, AAU. These are the leading research-oriented universities. Okay, so unlike a lot of universities, if you're at an AAU university, the idea is that you're going to be contributing to the knowledge base, expanding the knowledge base, and making sure that the knowledge base keeps moving forward. And part of your job is to challenge the knowledge base. And tonight you're going to see three talks uh, where the knowledge base is being challenged. I believe the knowledge base is wrong. Uh, in each of these three areas, and we're going to talk about how people at Michigan State are going to fix it. So as a research-intensive land-grant university, our mission is to advance knowledge and transform lives. My daughter teaches at Western Michigan. I'm so proud of her. She's in the business school at Western Michigan. She doesn't do research. That's kind of not what they do. Uh, but here at Michigan State, it's a huge part of our identity, and we're going to talk about the research program here at Michigan State. This is my vision of the knowledge base. Uh, in AAU, the knowledge base is defined in a really specific way. It's the, science, it's the refereed scientific literature that says something about a particular topic area. And this thing goes on infinitely. There's a section for business. There's a section for chemistry. There's a section for physics. There's a section for everything. The knowledge base just goes on. Some of these literatures go back 100 years, okay? 200 years, okay? This is the knowledge base. And if you're at an AAU research-oriented university, your job is to contribute to the knowledge base, defend the knowledge base, referee the knowledge base, so that this could be leveraged uh, for other particular purposes. Uh, the knowledge base, as this is defined in my particular field, these are the journals that uh, my colleague Quinetta will recognize. Uh, raise your hand if you read the Academy of Management Journal. Huh? And he said, no, you don't count. And you guys don't count either. I'm talking to the normal people, not, not the island of misfit toys. I'm talking to normal people, okay? No normal people read these things, okay? That, that's not your job. That's our job. Our job is to read these things, referee these things, contribute to these things. And this is just our discipline. Chemistry, all of these groups have different disciplines. And the idea is when you go back to the to the, to the knowledge base, this thing is constantly expanding and constantly improving. This is what we once believed. <laughs> the thing I like is not only is cigarette smoking good for you, it's really good for your throat. <laughs> there was a time that was in the knowledge base, okay? And obviously we fixed the knowledge base. The minute we stop doing research, the knowledge base just stops and freezes. Okay, this book right here, this book is from 1993. This is the first edition of my HR management book. And again, this leverages the knowledge base for HR management. It's 1993. Okay, this is the same book, 13 editions later, 2022. On average, the chapters in each of this book have about between 110 and 130 citations to the knowledge base, okay? And there's not a single citation in this book to anything before the year 2000. Everything that's in this book is, is like outdated, okay? Now, if you took my class um, and your son or daughter is taking my class and they asked you, can I just use your book? Do not let them, okay? Now, if they want to use the 12th edition and not the 13th, 
they might be able to get away with that. Okay, but they can't go back to 1993. Our job is to kind of challenge the knowledge base and to make sure that as stewards of the knowledge base, this thing is as correct as possible. And even though we don't have anything in this book as cringeworthy as cigarette smoking is good for you, when I read this book now, there are some things that make me cringe a little bit. Oh, we were so cute back then. It's such a fun age. Uh, but it's different. And so our job as research-oriented faculties contribute to the knowledge base and kind of keep this thing moving. You're going to see three talks today that definitely challenge the knowledge base. If you go to the knowledge base right now and ask, how do you manage cybersecurity? You'll pull it out and answer. And that answer is wrong. Um, Steve is going to fix that. But it's not going to be in a journal for five years. It's not going to be in a textbook for like eight years. And so this is the beauty of being at a research-oriented university. You get to know where the knowledge base is going. The knowledge base right now on cybersecurity is wrong. You might go to the knowledge base and say, hey, man, how do you build a board of directors? Gwyneth's going to show you if you go there now, it's wrong. Uh, and she's going to fix it. Uh, later, I'm going to talk about how to build teams. If you go to the knowledge base now, and how do you build a team? I'm here to tell you, it's wrong, uh, and we're going to fix it. Uh, and eventually, it'll get into a journal in five years from now. It'll get into popular press 10 years from now. But the beauty of being at an AAU research oriented university uh, is that you're in front of all of this, and you get to share that with students. Okay? We are not cover bands. We are doing real new music, um, and that's our job. And if we stop doing new music, there won't be anything for cover bands to do. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn this over to my first guest, uh, Stephen Melnick, our first preventer. Uh, uh, Steve Melnick is a supply chain operations management professor here at Michigan State. His research uh, focus includes supply chain risk and resilience, strategic supply chain management, behavioral research, and certified management standards. He's co-authored over 20 books and 90 articles, refereed articles, in, in the cloud. His research focuses on risk, resilience, strategic supply chain management. He's the editorial review board for a number of journals, which means he controls that space and who gets into that space and who doesn't. He's a member of Apex Board of Directors and the Academy of Management, which is why he gets the Academy of Management. Uh, the Operations and Supply Chain Division recognized him as a distinguished scholar in the field. He's going to show you why the cloud is wrong and how he's going to fix it. Well, like Monty Python said, and now for something completely different. You know, this is the one problem when you come after John. This is not going to be an improvement. Get ready. We're going to talk about something that's relatively new, and it is something that is so new, the body of knowledge about it is limited, it's not very insightful, and fundamentally it's wrong. So what we're going to do is talk about in terms of paradoxes. Let me begin by asking, okay, a simple question. How many in your organization have ever experienced a breach or have experienced identity theft? I have. I remember last year, for example, I got a note from Best Buy saying, when, when did you buy a computer and stuff worth $7,000 from Best Buy in Kentucky? My first response was, I've never been, even been in Kentucky. I don't even know what I'm going to buy there. How many of you have ever experienced an interruption of services due to a cyber hack? How many of you have to, had to change your security procedures because of cyber issues? How many of you now consider cybersecurity as a critical element of your requirements in terms of your suppliers? What those really talk about is the fact that we are now living in a very interconnected, dynamic world. It is a cyber world where the cyber assets are critical and people see value in them. Let me give you some idea how the importance of cybersecurity and risks and these attacks are. Think about the following. The value of cybersecurity breaches. In 2020, it was estimated that they're going to cost the world $6 trillion. How about this? This is more valuable and safer than drugs. So we're now attracting a better clientele. How about the following? A successful cybersecurity attack in the United States can cost up to $13 million to detect and mitigate and return to, to order. How about this one? What do you think the average time it takes to, from the time the attack occurs until you identify it and then you bring the system under control? In a world where things are changing quickly, according to IBM, 276 days. And that's the United States. How about this? 
In 2016, the GEO said that every important attack in the cyber, of cybersecurity occurred through the supply chain. I got to know about this in 2016 when I was invited by the National Defense Industry Association with whom I worked closely to look at a project which involved a DFAR requirement where the Department of Defense said, if you want to become a supplier to us, you have to be consistent with NIST 852. And what we found was that people were not responding. So what happened was I got involved and I've been following cyber since then and it's become a major research issue. Before we go on to that, I'm just going to make a statement. Everyone knows who that is up there. Warren Buffett, who made a statement recently that cybersecurity is as great a threat to humanity as was the atomic bomb. Think about that. One way of looking at what's going on is as I started to do research and as my team started to do research in this cyber, we started to find that there were a lot of things which are paradoxes, which are you think one thing, but it's really something very different. And that's what shaped our research. Let me begin with the first paradox. Cybersecurity is a corporate issue. That makes sense. Corporations invest in protecting their assets. They put in the right systems. Everything works. You put in zero trust networks. Everything works. The reality is that's wrong. Why? We are in an interconnected world. What we have found is that cybersecurity attacks occur not directly, but they occur through the, through the uh, supply chain. One example of that is in 2019, March, the Cyberspace Solarium, which is one of the rare things in Washington, D.C., it's a joint committee, did a report and they provided a number of recommendations, over 80. Well over half of those were focused on the supply chain. So this is a supply chain issue, first and foremost. The second paradox we got into was cybersecurity is something that only involves large firms. You know, if you think of it, large firms have the assets, they are investing, they have, you know, Willie Sutton, who was a bank robber in the 1930s, when he was asked why he robbed banks, said, that's where the money is. So if you're going to attack cyber resources, go for large companies. That's where the action is. The reality is, it's not. The action occurs at small to medium-sized companies. In most breaches, they are the weak link. Companies are accessing the supply chain, not directly, but through small to medium-sized enterprises, which is 500 employees or fewer. And then they're using leapfrog or water, watering hole attacks to get access to the information. By the way, the problem here is that our research in the small to medium-sized firms is really limited. One researcher put it best, we tend to treat small firms as really li large little firms, little large firms. They act like big ones, they're just small. They're not. They have very different behaviors. The third paradox we got into was cybersecurity is achieved by mandating compliance. You want to work with us? You got to be compliant. Don't want to be compliant? You can't work with us. That makes sense, doesn't it? Except it's wrong. Why? When we saw beginning in 2017 is that if you mandate compliance, firms, suppliers have a decision. Because what you're really doing is you're asking them to make investments in correcting problems, but they don't get the, they don't get the benefits. And if you're not a critical supplier, if you don't have good buyer-supplier relations with them, guess what they're going to do? They're going to leave. And we have seen that occur. One of the best examples is the Department of Defense. An article in Murphy Law, in Business Week, in Business Week Law in 2019, pointed out that in, 20, in 2009, the Department of Defense DIB, industrial, industri Defense Industrial Base, stood at over 72,000. In 2018, it was down to 132. It is now down to below 100,000. Suppliers are leaving, which focuses on the notion that it's not simply are you ready, are you willing to work with your customers. The third, it's an IT issue. It deals with you know, bits and bytes and it deals with issues like networks and protocols. But it's not, it's a relationship issue. What we found out is that if you have a good relationship with your suppliers, they are willing to make the investments. But here's the irony. 
Do you realize we have almost no measures dealing about focusing on the quality of the relationship? We, in essence, don't know whether we have a good one or a bad one. The only time we know about it is when the supplier leaves. The final one, cybersecurity solutions are unique. They're only applicable to cyber. That's what I thought until I saw something. The very things we do to improve cybersecurity are the same things we do for sustainability, resilience and risk, visibility. What this is really getting us to understand is our knowledge of cybersecurity is flawed. And the research we're doing here at State is trying to get that corrected. So what does this mean to you? Well, one of the things you want to do about creating knowledge is you want, to, you want to answer certain things. So first of all, we are working and quantifying, and we've got a proposal with National Science Foundation to quantify the concept of cybersecurity readiness. How do you determine whether a supplier is ready to do it? The second thing is we're starting to focus on measuring relationships. Measuring relationships not from the buyer's perspective, but from the supplier's perspective. And we're now developing scales, which are focusing on supplier burnout, supplier exhaustion, supplier cynicism, and efficacy. Here's something to think about. This year, in September, I did a presentation at the Association for Supply Chain Management. In front of over 400 people, I was one of the most highly attended sessions. And the focus was this, and the response we got was superb. We had one of the best ratings. And the comments we got are, this is a real topic and we don't know what to do. So we are addressing it. We're trying to quantify what, what constitutes a good customer. And we're finding out it's more than just paying on time. We're also trying to get people to understand something that's relatively new. This year, I was the keynote speaking at the NextGen Supply Chain Management Conference in Chicago. And I was the ending keynote speaker, which is the worst position to be in. I am the only thing that keeps the people from their airplane. What happened there is I was speaking with a senior executive from J&J, &J, and he made the following statement. Prior to the pandemic, we were in a world where supply was assured. The customer was king. In today's environment, supply is no longer assured. The supplier is king. Finally, we're focusing on small to medium-sized enterprises. Not only that, we're focusing on small to medium-sized minority because they're an under-researched area and they are a critical element in our supply chains. In many cases, they provide capabilities which are unique and that cannot be found anywhere else. So that's what we're doing. And we're also doing one final thing. Most companies, when they deal with supply chain management, they deal with what's one of those one tier up, one tier down. We're now looking at the second, the third, the fourth tier. We're going beyond the first tier. And we're trying to help organizations understand what they have to do to do that. What's interesting about everything that we've done here is it's not come from the literature. It's come because we at the supply chain department work closely with industry. And industry has told us clearly this is the next frontier. And our goal is to provide the solutions, the frameworks, the insights that can be used to manage that. As Sun Tzu said some 2,500 years, we are now in the period of chaos. But in chaos, there's also wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Questions? Yes? Does your research uh, look into like Russian cybersecurity? Well, cyber Russia, OK, that, the question that was asked, do we look at Russian cybersecurity? Indirectly. What we're now recognizing is, in the process of looking at cybersecurity, increasingly we have to deal with ransomware attacks. Ransomware attacks are being driven by three major factors. Ransomware is now becoming a service. You can go on the dark web and buy it. By the way, the customer service you get from them is better than what you get from your, from your uh, internet company. That's not saying much. Secondly, it's being driven by crypto. Thirdly, Russia is a safe haven. It's well known within the cybersecurity community that Russians tolerate hackers as long as they do not attack anybody whose uh, domain has an RU in it. And by the way, that's why we have to deal with them. Because one of the things that, there's another issue I forgot to mention, that 
that makes this problem really neat. We're dealing with very intelligent actors, which means as soon as you identify a solution, they figure it out and they become better. So this is a great problem. It's a dynamic problem. It's a problem in real time. And it has the two features we're looking for. It's fun to look at and, and practitioners really care about it. So the answer is yes, indirectly. By the way, that's called a, a typical academic answer. <laughs> yes? Um, yeah, what, um, would uh, AI slash machine learning help in, uh, with the last uh, thing you were talking about? Okay, that's a good question, because right now we've seen an over-reliance on AI. We started to see an awareness of AI, machine learning, all that. That's a possibility, but the problem we tend to find is those solutions depend upon, in the supply chain environment, depend upon the willingness of your partners to act. If your partners are not willing to act, then you have a problem. Let me give you an example of this, okay? Just to show you how important this is. One of the companies who's on the board for this proposal is a Fortune, five, Fortune 50, so they're a big company. They're dealing with a supplier that to the, this, cust this company as a customer is relatively small. And one of the things that they're worried about is if they go back to them and try to get them to work through using CMMC, which is uh, Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, or to work with, cyber, or to work with these devices, that the supplier is going to look at them and say, you're not worth it. The challenge for this buyer is if that supplier said no, it would take them two years, and according to this one person who's high up in the organization, to replace that supplier. So you have an interesting challenge because you have the tools. The problem is the tools are only useful when they're used. And therefore, how do you get the participants to use the tools? So that's a great, great question. And it's also one of the problems we've encountered. People have become overawed with artificial intelligence, and they haven't recognized that there's got to be a willingness. If you're not willing, I can have the best tools in the world, but they're going to just sit around gathering dust. Great question. Thank you. Steve's going to be available after for questions, but keeping us on schedule. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Quinetta Roberson. Uh, Coretta is the John A. Hanna Distinguished Professor of Management and Psychology at Michigan State. Prior to her current position, she was an endowed chair at Villanova and a tenured professor at Cornell University. Coretta has over 20 years of experience teaching courses and workshops globally on leadership, talent management, diversity, and her research and teaching are informed by the back, her background in finance, having worked as a financial analyst and small business development consultant. She served as an expert witness in employment discrimination lawsuits and provides professional advice and guidance for profit and nonprofit organizations. Quinetta got her PhD in organizational behavior from the University of Maryland, go Terps, uh, and holds undergraduate graduate degrees in finance. Professors Roberts' research interests focus on developing organizational capability, enhancing effectiveness in the strategic management of people, particularly diverse work teams. With that, I turn it over to my friend Quinetta Roberson, who will tell you about why the knowledge base is broken when it comes to composing boards. Thank you, John. So good evening. And before we start, you may be wondering why are we talking about boards? Why is it important to talk about boards of directors? And you know, boards are the primary oversight body of organizations. Pro for profit organizations have boards, not for profit organizations have boards, educational institutions have boards although we will not be talking about that tonight. Um, <laughs> but they serve very key functions in organizations. So one, for example, is to guide the strategic direction of an organization. Second is that they create a structure, provide a structure so that stakeholders and other individuals know that they are in good hands, that the organization is gonna act in their best interest. So, the question then is, given their importance, what's the science of building better boards? And if you look at research and practice, it says that it actually really isn't scientific. It's actually magic. And there's magic in the number two. That if you have two women or two people of color 
that you will have what's considered to be a critical mass, that there will be diversity, sufficient diversity on the team, such that you'll have better problem solving, better decision making, greater innovation, greater creativity. And because of this, because of this magic number two, what we know is that several organizations, including NASDAQ, has created a board diversity rule, which says that organizations must publicly disclose their diversity statistics, and they give them a template that they can use in order to report that. But if they don't have the magic number two, you don't have two women, you don't have two people of color, why not? So you have to talk about that, right? Because as we know, there is importance in having two on the board. But if we look at research findings, we have very little evidence of this magic number two. Nothing shows that that is the number that actually gets you a better functioning board. And I would like to hypothesize, using my academic words, um, that it is because it's an IPO problem. Now, all of you may be saying, wait, it's an initial public offering problem? And I'm going to give you a different IPO. That one, it's a question of what we would consider to be inputs. How do we form or create these boards? What are we actually looking for when we select board members? What happens in theory and in practice is actually a bit different. What we see is that a lot of times when selecting women and people of color for boards, that there is more of a focus on demography than on their skill set. As Steve talked about SMEs and their unique capabilities that they bring, there are very few organizations that actually focus on those capabilities, but more so that diversity that is brought to the board. Another thing is that there is a representation factor. Look, we got one uh, woman on our board. Look, we got one person of color on our board, right? It's more about the representation rather than thinking about when those unique skills and capabilities come onto the board, the synergies that are going to be created that helps the board function better. The other thing is thinking about where do we go to get those board members? How do we go recruiting women or people of color? Typically, when we look at what is done in practice, is that there's a lot of use of personal networks. That being particularly on a board begets becoming on a board. And typically for women and people of color, you have to almost prove yourself a bit. You have to have been on a board and show that you can be on a board in order to be on a board. Rather than thinking about the unique knowledge or skills and abilities that that person can actually bring. So one thing we have to think about is those inputs. There's an input problem. But the second thing is the peak, that there may be a process problem as well. So when I, think, when I talk about process, what I want to talk about is how boards do their work. So think about how work gets done on a board. Typically, boards are arranged in committee. They do their work in committee. And the SEC mandates that there are three primary committees that all publicly traded firms have to have. You have to have a nominating or governance committee, you have to have a compensation committee, and you have to have an audit committee. Now, I would challenge you in your free time, go look at some of the publicly traded companies and the people who are on those committees and chair of those committees, and I think that you will find very few women or people of color on those committees. Instead, they tend to be on the HR committee, the public relations committee, the community committee. Right, those things that are more outward facing, that help to gain market access, to gain legitimacy among external stakeholders, but not necessarily in the boards that matter. So the question is, if we actually address the input problem and put women and people of color on the board, are we actually using the diversity in the best way possible? The third thing, the O, is the output an output problem, or thinking about how do we evaluate the effectiveness of boards. Typically, what we do is we form a board, and then we look at the performance of the organization. Did they have high performance, net income, revenues, book, uh, book to market values, looking at equity, et cetera. But as we know, there are a lot of factors that can influence those kinds of outcomes. To say that the board influenced the stock price is a lot. Now, we, I do have other research that shows that when you announce certain board members that there is some fluctuation. But to be able to say that that actually drives it can be a leap. 
So we need to think about what are those kinds of outcomes that we're paying attention to when we're assessing board functioning. How do we know, how do we assess or evaluate what a high performing board looks like? And so we need to think about what are some of those outcomes or the output. So we have this IPO problem and you may be saying, Quinetta, how do we address that? And of course, I have an answer. Um, in particular, I have a project funded by the National Science Foundation to look at board diversity and the formation of boards, the process of boards, and the outputs of boards. And what our preliminary results suggest is that you should take three steps. And just as a sidebar, I've done two TEDx talks, and I learned in my training that you always got to give people something to take away, and you got to give them a number. So I'm going to give you three steps to take away. One, you got to identify your impact. What's your so what? What do you want trying to achieve? Right? Rather than start with forming the board, think about your end story. After I form this board, after the board does its work, what do we want that board to have achieved? What are our goals? What do we want to be able to say that we have done? And so as we think first about the impact, then we can then go to the next step. Number two is to think about how the work gets done. Maybe your work is done in committee, particularly with the nominating or governance committee or an audit committee or a compensation committee. If those are the committees that matter, then you want to make sure you have diversity in those committees because that's where you're going to get the diversity of thought. You're going to get the problem solving, the innovation, the creativity, the decision making, all of the good things that come from the divergent thinking in the places that it matters. And that's what our results are showing preliminarily, that if we put people in those places that matter, then the board is actually doing the work. Not saying it's easy work, but they're wrestling with the questions, they're wrestling with the strategic direction, they're doing all the things they need to do in order to get to the output that they want. So once we know where we want to go and what we need to do, then the third thing is to go get them. Right? It's to find the talent that we need to achieve those goals. And in particular, thinking about what are those essential capabilities and where you can find them. And I want to underscore essential capabilities because think about if, uh, I don't know, I'll take me for example. If I'm on a board and your competitor, let's say I'm on your board, and your competitor organization recruits me for their board. Well, there's a law of diminishing returns, right? I'm now bringing my unique skills and abilities to two different boards. So the question is, is that actually a competitive advantage? So you want to think about what are those essential but unique skills and abilities and what's the synergy that's going to be created by having that diversity on the board. And thinking about where do we get, where do we find that that those unique or essential capabilities. It may not be through those personal networks. It may be through different sources, different pipelines, figuring out where people who have leadership experience and unique vantage points, but may have not served on a board. If we can do that, identify your impact, determine how work gets done, finding the talent you need, what I would argue is that you then can actually move from magician to scientist, but more importantly, you can build better boards. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions for uh, uh, Quinetta. So are you doing any work and how do you actually find that down? Because these are the people that are not at the forefront, right? That people are going in that one. These are the people that are hidden below that really have the expertise in order to be able to step up. Yeah, so, so one thing I'm gonna challenge you on is not hidden below, but I would say hidden to hard stop, right? Because what we find, for example, is maybe it's a board in a pharma industry and everyone's looking for that pharma experience. But the question is, is that what's needed in order to bring those benefits to the board? So maybe you look in a different industry. There is a Harvard Re Business Review article that shows that, um, that women and people of color typically have a wealth of leadership experience, although it may not be in a for-profit context. It may be a not-for-profit context in their uh, churches, in volunteer organizations, etc. And what our data preliminarily show is that men, many of the women and people of color on boards 
are actually overqualified, where they had lots of leadership experience, they've spent years in these positions, although it isn't in the, these cookie cutter positions in terms of being on a for-profit board, for example. So it's more about finding, and you know, there are, um, there are uh, feeder programs about for boards on, that are training women and people of color on getting onto boards, on building those networks. There are um, university professors. Uh, and other places, though, where there are people who have, again, that's why it's about finding the capabilities that you need and thinking where is the best place to go to get that. Does that answer your question? Okay. I'll try to get to the more side later. Okay. All right. Yes? So that's an interesting question. So our data set are the Fortune 1000, uh, S&P 1000, however you want to phrase it, which means we only have certainly publicly uh, available information. What we do have, what we, um, in thinking about number two, how the work gets done, our data show that by having more diverse boards, you get um, higher risk taking. You get better um, corporate social responsibility or CSR performance. And there's some, we're, we're starting to see some, it depends on the measure that you use for innovation, whether you use R&D expenditures, et cetera, but you see some kind of indicators of innovation. What we would have to do is to go to each of those companies to code them to see if you have a DEI strategy or what's the value for DEI in your organization to be able to see if that makes a difference. My Hypothesis would be that it doesn't because I think organizations think about their boards differently than they think about their top management teams or something internal. So internal diversity means something different or, or, or leadership diversity means something different than board diversity. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna bring this show in on time. Uh, I want to talk about uh, rewriting the rules of teamwork, and I feel responsible for this because I wrote a lot of the rules that need to be rewritten uh, over the last few years. So I want to talk about uh, evolutions in work design. Many of you realize that all of a sudden, uh, US organizations in many different ways started building team-based structures. Team-based structures came along because if you had a job that an individual could do working alone independently, that job either got automated or it got offshore so far away that you couldn't possibly compete with them in Western societies. Okay? The jobs that remained became increasingly specialized and the only reason to have this job in a Western society is because it required specialized skills of people working together. Anything other than that is going to be, uh, you're not going to be able to compete. Now as time goes on, uh, we see a rise of multi-team systems in the, in, the, in, the, in the 2000s. The idea of multi-team systems is that traditional teams were really s too small to accomplish a lot of work, and so now they're trying to see how can we make these teams bigger, and so then we see the introduction of something called a multi-team system. The key to a multi-team system is these teams right here uh, work with other teams. And if you go to the knowledge base, the knowledge base on teams goes back uh, 80 to 100 years. Almost all of that knowledge base was built on individual teams working alone. And so the idea that teams are gonna be working together is kind of new. Uh, one place where this really became popular was in the US military. Uh, and you can read a book by General McChrystal where he talks about all the different multi-team systems that put, were put together. But the one that really got this started was in the hunt for bin Laden. In the hunt for bin Laden in 2001, they had him isolated in a place called Tora Bora. And we had four large organizations, the Army, uh, the Air Force, the CIA, uh, the uh, National Security Agency, these large organizations were trying to work together and it was a disaster. Uh, in the end, they dropped more bombs on Tora Bora that were dropped on Berlin in the last two weeks and bin Laden walks out. Uh, they recognize that this is no way to compete. And so the military turns to multi-team systems where now you have a team from NSA, a team from the CIA, team from the Army. And these people can take all the information out of their organization without having to ask their supervisor, without having to fill it out of a form, without whatever. You got all the expertise of these groups without any of the bureaucracies. Uh, in the end, uh, using multi-team systems, Bin Laden is taken out with three bullets, tap, tap, tap. 
Uh, for the US military, this was the difference between tactically competing with large organizations uh, versus flexible, adaptable, multi-team systems. The problem with studying multi-team systems, though, and the military has recognized this, that this is why we're funded from the Army Research Institute, is this is a relatively difficult place to do research. Multi-team systems tend to be very unique in the field, and so it's always like comparing apples and oranges. And if you try to do labor, laboratory-based research, it just requires so many subjects. Now, we have done a lot of this at Michigan State. If you want to go to the second floor of this building, we have the Kessler Leadership Lab, and you can see that that is actually set up for three teams working together. And so a lot of the empirical science on multi-team systems was developed here at Michigan State because we're one of the few places that has that facility. Now, you can see in this bottom picture what it, a normal lab looks like with just one team and five people. And I will tell you, every university that does research on teams has something like that, but they don't have anything like what we have. Now, the scary thing about what we're finding is that interdependent teams do, do not work like independent teams. Five specific things, if you go to the knowledge base and say, hey, I want to build a good team, what should I do? Number one, the knowledge base will tell you these teams need to be totally interconnected so that everybody can talk to everybody. I'm here to tell you that is wrong because in a multi-team system, the amount of communication links rises exponentially. And therefore, very quickly, people are talking over each other. And so this notion that you're going to have completely interconnected networks is fine if you have a small standalone team. It doesn't work in multi-team systems. Team empowerment. The literature will tell you the team should be empowered to make their own decisions. They can go left. They can go right. That's great if you're an individual team. If you're a team that's working with my team and all of a sudden you're empowered and I expect you to go left and you went right, that looks like lack of reliability for me. And so again, in terms of team empowerment, the literature is wrong. Team identity, we want teams that are co cohesive, identical, okay? In multi-team systems, you often have to sacrifice for the other teams in your unit. And the more identity you have and the more cohesiveness, the less likely people are to, are, are to substitute their goals for other people's goals. Emergent transacted memory systems, the group should be allowed to develop their own language, their own rules, their own norms that fit them, okay? If you develop very idiosyncratic emergent norms, it's very difficult for my group to work with your group because I can't figure out what you're doing versus if you have formalized rules and procedures. And finally, shared mental models, teams that are really good uh, standalone teams have a lot of heuristics, they have a lot of jargon, they have a lot of acronyms that are really good team. You can't even figure out what they're saying sometimes because they're so cohesive. This makes it very, very difficult to work with other teams. Now, because we now face the inconvenient truth that virtually the entire knowledge base about teams is built upon independent teams, we have to fix this. Uh, but we said it's hard to fix because this is a difficult space. And so what we're doing at Michigan State, along with a $2.3 million grant from the Army Research Institute, who we're uh, supporting here, uh, we're trying to create a national infrastructure for multi-team system research. That if you can come up with a lab that has a room for five people, we're going to connect you into the cloud so that you can interact with any other university. Right now, we're working with Arizona State and Penn State. And if you were to go to my lab on any given day right now, you'd see one team at Michigan State interacting with the team at Penn State, working with the team at Arizona State, okay, in the cloud, working on the same task. Uh, we can run somewhere between 75 and 100 teams a semester now if we do it this way. Now, this is a proof of concept for a much larger grant where we want to really build the national infrastructure for this so that we will have 50 AAU universities in the national infrastructure. Uh, supported by uh, funds from the U.S. Department of Defense. We started this talk saying that we are an AAU university. We want to be part of the AAU. And so if we can create a national infrastructure for multi-team system research with 50 AAU universities where the center of this is located in Michigan State, that would be mission accomplished for us uh, in terms of how this is done. And we'll be manipulating a lot of interdependence. Uh, we have a camera system that we can uh, talk about after. We have a task that everybody plays at the same time. But in the end, we are rewriting the rules of teamwork. And the only way we can do this is to create a national infrastructure with 50 different universities all working together centered here in East Lansing. Questions, comments, or reflections? <clears throat>
Yeah, it, one of the first things that a lot of this research took place in the Air Force, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research is kind of where this got started. And the amazing thing is it almost doesn't matter what role people in the Air Force had. The minute we put them on our simulator and said, this group is Intel, this group is ops, this group is the leadership or liaison team, the minute you just assign those names or labels to the teams, this guy's a lawyer, this person's a doctor, this person's a, a pilot. But if you put them in the simulation, they immediately fall into these roles. And just like in real life operations, operations people hate Intel people. It happens like in no time at all. It's like, you're not even a real live Intel person, okay? But you immediately, once you assign these roles to people, you start seeing norms develop within those groups. And so, uh, and we, we, we try to have our Arizona State people wear colors, our Penn State people wear colors, our Michigan State people wear colors, so that when they see the other team, they see the colors. Uh, and so again, it's can you get these teams that are solid teams, perhaps individually, can you get them to work with other teams? Uh, and the degree to which the things that we think are really important to effective teams actually stand in the way of you being a good team in terms of interacting with others. We have time for one more question. And then Sean's gonna reopen the bar. See? Yeah, I think one of the things that we talk about is fault lines. Uh, in particular, if one group is all this particular category and this other group is this other particular category, again, that's the kind of thing that makes them rapidly cohesive, rapidly shared identity. But it also makes it increasingly difficult for them to work with other particular teams. And so one thing you'd like to do is what we call cross-categorize. That is, if you look at the other team, there's somebody in that team that looks like you or uh, acts like you. And that the more you can cross categorize teams so that when they look at each other, they can see commonalities across that, the better. To the extent that you have really strong fault lines in teams, not only are these three different teams, but these teams are a bunch of old people. These people are a bunch of this. Okay, the minute you have that kind, it just makes all of these things worse, okay? And yet some of that stuff right there makes teams quickly cohesive, quickly operational uh, because of the shared identity. All right, with that, We'll Great. turn this Great. back over Thank to you. my boss. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much um, to our excellent speakers tonight. Thank you, Steve, Quinetta, and John. I think you got a chance to really see uh, a glimpse of the exceptional research, exceptional faculty that we have here, and how they're really contributing to the new knowledge base and pushing uh, knowledge and research forward. So you have um, contact information, and so please feel free to, to reach out to uh, Steve, Quinetta, and John. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. We have some dessert, uh, some food, and the bar will be back open, as Sean and John just talked about. So please stay and enjoy some networking, enjoy some time to interact with our three featured speakers. And also, I really encourage you to stay connected with us. Um, we have lots of different ways that you can connect, certainly through social media, but also our monthly alumni newsletter. And we just continue to look forward to ways to reconnect and re-engage with you and continue to be part of your educational experience uh, and lifelong learning opportunities. So thank you very much. Pleasure to uh, host the event. Pleasure to meet you. Enjoy some networking. And as always, go green. <laughs>